Our world is defined by its infinite possibilities. Horizons, borders, limits, these are just words, and words are just mouth sounds that signify meaning. Success blooms where opportunity and imagination synergize. Here at Ordinary Media Limited International Incorporated, we believe you deserve to experience everything the world has to offer. But before you can afford any of that, you're probably going to need to get an office job. Welcome then, fellow salary monkey, to Ordinary Things, where ordinary things are explained. Today we'll be roaming the corridors and cubicles of the modern office, also known as the wage cage. But what is an office? An office is a room or building used to conduct professional and commercial work, as well as 85% of extramarital affairs. The average desk jockey spends about 90,000 hours at the office, or a third of their life, meaning the only place you'll spend more time is your coffin. But where did the office come from? Up until the early 19th century, business was slow. Slow as balls. Companies were as local as they were lackadaisical, as it wasn't feasible and therefore profitable to transport their goods and services beyond their provincial communities. That all changed with the rise of the railroad. These smoke-spewing speed machines allowed far-flung businesses to communicate and exchange goods with enormous ease. And as these companies started to get that paper, they also started to accumulate paperwork, so they had to hire someone to keep track of it all. At first, people saw clerical workers as dweeby little soft-handed goblins that rarely saw the sun. Give them a gamer chair and an intricate knowledge of 4chan memes, and they were basically the YouTubers of their day. But office workers were fine with this. They saw themselves as an emerging middle class, and due to their constant proximity to the boss, they were also the likely inheritors of the businesses they were crunching numbers for. Plus, you were also much less likely to get pulled into some kind of grinding machine and having your organs squeezed out like hot toothpaste. But as industry continued to expand first nationally, then globally, so too did the white collar workforce. Offices got bigger and busier, and soon they were straining harder than Chris Christie's gastric band to keep everyone productive and organized. Enter a man named Frederick Taylor. He proposed a system he called process management. Academics called Taylorism, and everyone else called the worst thing since sliced dick. He broke each job down into its individual motions, determined which were essential, and then timed workers on each individual task with a stopwatch. Um, the effect of this process was to assign workers specific tasks that could only be done by the same person, thus turning office workers into efficient but mind-numbing specialists. Enforcing this philosophy of efficiency, though, was a full-time job in and of itself, so it gave rise to a new profession. The manager. Before Taylorism, talentless, psychopathic, empathy vampires had to make do with careers in the military or clergy. When the position of manager opened up, they could finally secure gainful employment as stopwatch-wielding pedants with power boners. As offices got larger and more regimented, managers and executives squirreled away into private offices to avoid the paper-pushing hoi polloi. And before you could say turn of the century, offices had begun to resemble the factory floor they were supposed to represent and escape from. By the 1920s, businesses were growing at such speeds that they could no longer store their human cattle free-range, and had to start building giant battery farms in the sky. The literal rise of the skyscraper is one of the hallmarks of 20th century capitalist progress, but these giant concrete penises weren't just neat to look at, they were also the monolithic wrapping paper for the modern office. Between 1871 and 1923, New York built about 74 million square feet of office space. Through the 1930s, they added nearly 30 million more to that. And into this jungle of brick and mortar phalanalia walked a French-Swiss architect named Le Corbusier, who, in typical French-Swiss style, had a look around, took a single drag on a self-rolled cigarette, and started poking holes in everything he saw. Le Corbusier hated 1920s New York almost as much as he hated Jews or wearing his glasses properly but he saw the city's potential. He designed what he saw as the ideal vision of an office district, his radiant city, multiple giant identical buildings intersecting and serving a uniform function. Like most 20th century European intellectuals though, he was better at criticizing stuff than actually building anything. But he was perhaps the most influential architect since the guy who invented the ceiling, as it wasn't so much his buildings that stood the test of time as it was his philosophy. He believed that buildings could change the way we think and behave. Offices in particular should be designed to increase efficiency and to turn people into busy little worker ants. Why police every finger twitch and bathroom break to maximize efficiency when the building can do it for you? 
Other, more commercially successful architects loved this philosophy, as it made them feel like social engineers rather than failed artists who could only draw in straight lines. The main effect of this inspiration was the birth of the international style of architecture, a school of design that would be dominant in office buildings until the 1970s. And what the international style loved more than anything was glass, and lots of it, transforming office blocks into giant magnified fish tanks. But the thing about glass is that when the sun touches it, it gets really fucking hot, and soon office workers everywhere were sweating harder than Prince Andrew apparently doesn't. I, I can absolutely categorically tell you it never happened. From the 1930s to the 1950s, office life built into a crescendo of corporate conformity. More and more companies began demanding loyalty, not just from their workers, but from their spouses as well. The office wasn't just a place of work anymore, it had become a social ecosystem. So the notion of company culture emerged from the primordial capitalist ooze, a hive-minded perspective best exemplified by the boys over at IBM. By the 1930s, IBM had perfected the art of moulding their employees into identically dressed obedient yes-men. Office walls were decorated with Stalinist photos of the company's founder, Thomas Watson, and meetings often began with the recital of fellowship songs. And there were hundreds of them, all literal hymns to the company and its self filating founder. But it wasn't all bad. Companies rewarded their brown-snouted minions by transforming offices into miniature cities. This is London's Shell Centre. At the time of its completion in 1951, it was the tallest building in the city. As well as an office, it contained restaurants, shops, and whatever the fuck this thing is. This was the age of human relations. Companies still demanded loyalty and cult-like devotion, but they also provided stuff like squash courts and discounted meals. After 100 years, it looked like the office was here to stay. So what do you do when you've been in the same place forever and you still want to change? You make a big deal out of moving the furniture around. In the late 1950s, two German siblings named the Schnell brothers had a Schlieffen plan to turn the average office worker into an Ubermensch of productivity. They called it Burolandschaft, which translates literally to office landscape. The idea was to treat the office as a functional whole, organizing it by paper flow and dynamic human movement, rather than cutting it up into spaces of hierarchical status. It also gave office workers some much needed Lievenstrom by advocating for things like a break room. There were no closed doors or privileged executive spaces, only a few movable partitions. The Schnell brothers' vision of the office helped workers focus uninterrupted, turning the place into a veritable camp of concentration. Wait, no, not that! <laughs> then in the early 1960s, iconic furniture company Herman Miller goose-stepped into the office design game. The company had already made classic contributions to office furniture, like the Eames chair, the Nelson bubble lamp, and this rapey desk advert from the 1950s. Visit your Herman Miller dealer soon and learn how the 9000 Executive Series can lend efficiency and elegance to your working environment. But the company's most penetrating contribution to the workplace was Robert Proust's Action Office. Rather than a specific piece of furniture or a simple collection, Proust's action office was a proposition for a new kind of space. Most offices, then and now, are designed to keep their workers desk-bound, but the action office envisioned a more kinetic environment. Proust described it as a mind-orientated living space and a place for transacting abstractions. He was a visionary designer, but he also spoke exclusively in butt-sniffing jargonese. The action office was colourful, pop art inspired, it defined itself against the conformity of the grey offices of the past. The press loved it, and it won industry awards. But despite this reception, the action office sold poorly. It was too expensive and too vaguely defined, and it just didn't look like any office that people were familiar with. Undeterred, Proust rolled back the expensive furniture and individualistic aesthetic, and produced the bargain bin sequel, Action Office 2, Budget Boogaloo, somehow retroactively starring Jeremy Renner. It was a workstation, made of three walls which the worker could arrange and move with ease. It was also devoid of any personal style, so workers could use tack boards to personalise the area themselves. Sounds good, right? What could possibly go wrong? Well, Proust didn't know it yet, but he just invented the cubicle. The Action Office 2 quickly became Herman Miller's signature product, and other companies were quick to copy and paste it into their own catalogues. But the Action Office imitators only made things worse. 
the partitions got taller and the cubes got smaller. Companies quickly converted. The lightweight, disposable material made it extremely cheap to rearrange virtually any workspace. And crucially, it allowed them to cram as many of their meat assets as possible into these carpeted cages. The average office worker had just been transferred from gem pop to solitary confinement, and he didn't even get to shank anyone on the way out. Instead of making the office more dynamic, it made them more regimented and much more sedentary. The cubicle farm was the dominant form of office space for the better part of two decades, transforming the floors of large companies into grayscale labyrinths of isolation, where people sat, gawking at the Sisyphean crawl of a progress bar as their calves calcified and their cranium content reached the chemical consistency of a colostomy bag. But then, in the 90s, things started to change. A slew of tech companies began springing up in California that were young, dumb, and full of dot com. Flush with digital dollars, these companies rejected the old ways and modeled their buildings on college campuses. Ironic, considering they were run by turtle necked and turtle headed college dropouts and populated by the kind of people whose college experience mostly consisted of making love to their favorite gym sock. <laughs> The dot-com model became the new aspired standard for businesses everywhere, but in many ways the ideal dot-com office was simply a reboot of the human relations era. Company culture was back, baby, but this time its emphasis was on flexible work hours and non-hierarchical structures. Dot-com businesses were attractive because they made their workers feel like artists, autonomous and free. The illusion of personal freedom is how tech companies tricked their gormless keyboard cattle into working longer hours than any other white-collar sector. They also organized work activities and team-building exercise that were supposed to feel like leisure. But this ended up blurring the already fuzzy line between a worker's expected hours and their actual leisure time. Hang in there, kitty. Only 40 more years and you can add an extra digit to your retirement fund. Yes, companies like Google did emerge that did seem to offer a genuine sense of freedom with time for employees to work on their own projects. You know, when they weren't designing flying murder robots for the American military. Credit where credit is due, the dot-com businesses did lead the charge in finally tearing down those cubicle walls. Everyone finally realized that those grayscale gulags were a bit shit. So the 90s saw a return to the open plan office. Today, around 80% of American offices are open plan. The idea behind them being that they're more social, more spacious, and therefore human and collaborative. And while that seems logical, it's actually bollocks. While the cubicle might have sucked box, the open plan office isn't much better, and in some ways, it's significantly worse. Nearly every productivity study comes back with the same result. Open plan offices perform terribly compared to those that offer private and more dynamic spacing arrangements. You see, no amount of furniture shuffling can ever get rid of the problem that exists in every office other people. Unsurprisingly, having others constantly in your eye line is distracting. But it's not just their pale, defeated faces you have to put up with, you also have to ingest their mouth sounds through your ear holes. And while you'd think that having everyone in the same room would foster collaboration, it actually does the opposite. In a Royal Society study, it was found that when an office converted to open plan, face-to-face -face interactions went down by a whopping 70%. The reason being that we don't want to distract everyone else. So maybe the best thing to do is to get rid of the office altogether. Well, for a lot of people, that's exactly what's happening. Since the 2008 financial oopsie daisy, we've seen an exponential rise in both remote offices and freelance work. By 2020, it's estimated that over half the British workforce will spend a good deal of their week working remotely. So it looks like soon we'll be free of the office altogether. Isn't it nice? when the video has a happy ending. Hurrah, say the Lancers of Freedonia. The world is our cubicle now. We can work in our gorgeous home offices or in trendy cafes where everyone has the latest MacBook and the sexy baristas paint dollar signs in the froth of your flat white. Right? Fuckity wrong. And here's why. It's not really that the office is being done away with. It's our traditional understanding of what it means to be an employee. As of 2018, 35% of the American workforce is freelance. And when it comes to young people just starting their careers, that rate rises to 52%. And while we do get to feel all smug about technically owning our own business, it also means that our employment status is more tenuous, our chance of elevation is slim, and we're more at the mercy of our corporate overlords than ever before. That's right, if you just sign here, you'll be working for us. Not literally, of course. You'll be an independent contractor, which means you don't have to worry about things like cubicles or commuting. And we don't have to worry about things like employment rights, severance pay, health insurance, putting a roof over your head, or whether you live or die. <laughs>
Remote working is leading us to a depressed, isolated, cash-strapped workforce. A survey conducted by Epson Research found that 21% of freelancers surveyed had at some point felt suicidal because of loneliness. Like Taylorism and the cubicle before it, remote working may just be the latest trend in workplace social alienation. It also means that many are being forced to rent out their own office space. And that's where parasitic, unprofitable, tax-avoiding startups like WeWork come to fill the void. And does it work? No, not even a wee bit. The company is currently hemorrhaging money, $5,000 for every beanie-wearing toe rag that they can cram into their formaldehyde-filled co-wanking spaces. And even coffee shops are getting wise, with some London cafes daring to rent out chair space so freelancers have to pay to park their caffeine-loosened bean holes next to the one available plug socket. Plug. Whatever the future of the office is, employees would do well to know what their employers should be giving them. And while three grey walls might be oppressive, they at least owe you a fucking ceiling. The story of the office, then, is evidence for that golden mantra of modern life. You can't polish a turd. But that won't stop giant multinationals from paying legions of excrement varnish consultants to do just that. Hey, I get in my face. Why are you both wearing different suits instead of the suit? In the late 1950s, two German brothers named the Schnell Brothers 